Hey guys, thank you for joining us at uh, Sedaniel Church Online. Um, it's great to have you. Um, welcome. I was thinking this week about this whole context of where the church is at, where we as believers are at. And uh, there's one thing that was kind of quite challenging for me just to, to grasp, and that is how can we be on mission while we in a situation like we are at the moment. And uh, the great thing with Church Online is that it gives us an opportunity not only to be passive, but actually to be, um, to be intentional and missional in this process. So I want to encourage you, uh, while the sermon goes on or the worship, I want to encourage you to connect with people in the chat room. If you've got any questions, ask us any questions. We would love to connect with you. Um, but also the way you can be missional in this time is not only to be to kind of sit and wait for, for um, everything to change for us to go back to normal, whatever normal will be after that. But I want to encourage you. Um, you'll see there's an invite button. Click on the inv invite button. Invite some friends. Get some guys connected. Get them part of what we're doing. Um, because we believe God is doing something great, not only in the city, but in the nations and the nations of the world. And the great thing is through this platform God has given us, you can be intentional and you can reach people and we can trust God together to make a difference. So, so enjoy the, the celebration. Enjoy this time. Invite your friends. And uh, also at the end we will have, we'll put a link into, into the chat room and we're going to have a Zoom Connect um, together. So please join us on that Zoom Connect and um, let's, uh, let's continue with fellowship even though we're not together in, in, in the physical, but we're still together. Um, and yeah, enjoy it and bless you. Thanks a lot. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail No, my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the
we had the opportunity to call some people that visited our church and um, I was so blessed with the one lady. She was so appreciative because she said she received food from us and not just food, but on top of that, we called her to ask how she's doing and to pray for her. And that was such a blessing for her because she's not even in our church, but still we care for her. So I want to encourage you today. Don't you want to call someone or WhatsApp someone or maybe just pray for someone? Because in this time, it is such a blessing to know that someone cares for you. So don't you want to stand with us and let's worship our King.
Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this amazing opportunity to, to be able to share in your word and to share in the, in the things that you did for us and your victory, Father, the blessing that you have poured out upon us, Jesus, and the, and the amazing reality to know you, Jesus. And I thank you for this amazing opportunity to grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, what an amazing opportunity for us to do this together, even when it's online. Uh, take this opportunity to give. Uh, our details will be on the screen. And also you can visit our website. This is an amazing opportunity. So welcome to part four of our series, Our Father. And uh, the title of our message today is, I can't pay him back. That's the question I want to ask. Could you ask someone in your room there, you ask them, I can't pay him back. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. The fact that we cannot pay our father back. And I want to talk to you about my personal dad. I, I, I had a great upbringing. My father was an amazing dad. Not a perfect dad at all, full of faults. He, he really got, became radical for God after my brother and I committed our lives to Jesus. So my father really later on in his life really started becoming serious about God, but he was still a great father. Um, I, my father taught me how to, how to live free from the mistakes of the past. I remember making mistakes as a boy and how my father would just never bring it up again. He, once he's forgiven me, it would be like it's over. When I brought it up, my father would say, listen, that is forgiven. And I mean, I was so amazed because sometimes there's this sense of, I needed to pay him back. I remember uh, one Friday afternoon, we were on our way to, uh, to a, a city in, 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 in this country and we were going to work for the weekend and uh, he needed to put a battery in the car and this battery was now fully charged, ready to be used and as I was carrying the battery, <laughs> the battery fell and batteries are expensive in, 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 in this country, batteries are exp expensive and for me as a young boy, I dropped this, I, was, I think I was about 14 years old I dropped it and the battery, the battery fell on its side and then the acid of that battery just spilt everywhere. And as that acid just spilt everywhere, I really realized I've just now lost probably months and months of my hard work. I used to work on weekends and I made a lot of money. That just cost me months and months of my hard work. My dad was so disappointed because we needed to drive with this car to the place where we we're going to work. And it, was, it, was, it was a massive disappointment. And we drove in the car in silence because I knew... I had messed up badly. We ended up taking another car because this car's battery was now ruined and my dad had to get to work. And so we drove for about an hour, um, hour literally in silence, hour and a bit. We drove in silence. And I'll never forget my dad still stopping along the side of the road and he bought us some, some biltong, which is an, an amazing treat for us as South Africans. And literally as he, was, as he bought the biltong, I thought I was, he wasn't going to give me any biltong because I just messed up so badly. And my father, uh, that night while I was working, I was earning tips. I was a waiter. I was earning tips. And I'll never forget this. Telling my dad, Dad, I'd like to give you the money back for the battery. And my dad said to me, my boy, we're never going to talk about that again. You don't have to pay me back for the mistake that you made. Our fathers often define us. And I want to ask you today, will you let your heavenly father define you? Will you allow your Heavenly Father to define you? I've spent time with numerous pastors and leaders all over the world. And I've seen that if they have had a bad father, they're struggling to lead their families, they're struggling to lead their churches, they're struggling to be secure in their leadership. Why? Because they're constantly feeling like they owe, they owe, they, they need to earn, they need to work harder, they need to do something in order to prove their, their, their value to prove their worth and I, and I see so many still struggling believers people that are walking with God people that are serving God people that are preaching the gospel struggling to be secure in their father because they do not have a revelation of what the father has done and they feel like they have to pay the father back your fathers mean so much to us I was in a meeting just last week with a, a, a pastor in Australia and this guy, he says to me, great church, powerful leader, phenomenal uh, ministry. And this guy's testimony was that he grew up in a home with different, different brothers. And literally what happened is, is he said his experience with his father was so different than their experience. And now his life is so different than their lives. Why? Because of the way that he responded, the way that he connected with his father changed the way that he lives. And today he's living a very fruitful life. I'd like us to watch this little video clip. And I believe you're going to be blessed because you're going to see how valuable it is for us.
to have a father at our big moments in our lives, to have a father affirming us, how much a father means. And as you watch this, I want to ask you, open your hearts and receive from our heavenly father, his love and his grace. touched me again just watching it it just touched me again to see how much the father means to us today i want to say i want to say to you that our father does not miss any big moment in our lives our father is omnipresent he will never ever leave us nor forsake us our father is always there for us our father will not just send a note because our father is our abba our daddy we can come to our father we can experience our father we can enjoy our father, Tim Keller, said the following. He says, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access. We have that kind of access. And you know what I find? I find that so many people, they forget the price that was paid for them. They forget the access that they've got. And if you forget how much you've been forgiven, you're going to struggle to access the Father. If you forget how much the Father loves you, you're going to struggle to love Him. Jesus said, if we've been forgiven much, we'll love much. If you're struggling to love much, maybe you've forgotten how much you've been forgiven. Could you open your heart? Could you be filled with wonder again? Many people say to me, but Mark, why do we need to talk about the younger brother? We're, we're saved already. The younger brother was one of those, those unbelieving guys. I'm here to say that if you've forgotten how you were as a younger brother, you're going to struggle to come home to the Father. And Christianity is all about coming home to the Father, experiencing the Father, having a relationship with the Father. Home is not a place, physical place. Home is a relationship 
with the Father. If you're far from God yet today, we're going to talk about the younger brother and how he left the Father. And I'm here to say that you might be far from the Father, but the Father is saying to you, come home. But if you've been close to God, I want to ask you today to come close to the Father, to experience the Father, and to know that the place that you and I have been created for is intimacy with the Father, security in the Father, to be forgiven much and to love much. Verse, verse 11 of Luke 15 is where we're going to start today. We're going to look at this third parable. Remember, we're looking at the prodigal sons. We, we're actually seeing how these sons connected with, with the Father differently and how you and I can learn from Jesus how to engage with our Heavenly Father. He says in verse 11, he, then he said, a certain man had two sons. Now you must understand, remember what Rory spoke about? Rory said, sons have, in, have an inheritance. So we have an inheritance. Verse 12 says, The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his, his livelihood. He divided to them his livelihood. Listen to this. The youngest son comes to the father and says, Father, I want my inheritance now before you die. Now, we must understand that inheritance and a testament, a will, was only put into effect when the father died. But the youngest son's coming to the father and he's saying to him, give me my portion. Now, the way the portions worked was the oldest son would always get the double portion. That's why Jesus Christ is the firstborn. He's the older brother. And when we're in him, we get the double portion of our heavenly father. Why? Because we're in Christ. We are one with him. He is our older brother. And we're going to look at that over the next few weeks. But this is so powerful. Because the youngest son then understands that he's going to get his portion. The oldest son, if there were only two sons, the oldest son would then get the double portion, which means the oldest son would get two-thirds of the inheritance, and the youngest son would get one-third of the inheritance. He divided, the father then would divide his property. Another translation says he divided his property or his land among them. So what the father then did is, the only way that the father could give the son what the son was asking for is the father had to divide what he had. It wasn't like the father could go to the bank and draw some money. No, this is a Middle Eastern context where this patriarch, this father, Jesus is speaking obviously, remember, to tax collectors and sinners and to religious leaders and teachers of the law. He's speaking to people that understand this culture and Jesus is saying to them, showing them the heart of the father, showing them how the father is committed to his children, how the father does the un, un unthinkable uh, thing by actually loving the son through his waywardness. Now what most of them would do in that culture is the son would be chased away by the father. If the son had to come with a request like that, the father would say, I want nothing to do with you because you do not deserve a thing. And so this is what happens to the father. The father doesn't do that. The father divides his livelihood or divides his property. The word for that, the Greek word, is bios. Now that Greek word bios also speaks of the course of life or by, or by life sustained. So that Greek word speaks of the life. See, the father did not just give him some of his possessions. The father divided his life among his sons. The father gave a piece of himself to the youngest son. Now, giving a piece of himself, the way they did it is, you must understand, in this culture, that the, that the land was passed on from generation to generation to generation. So the land and people's identity were connected. So the life of the father and the land of the father was connected. The, you must understand that this was probably the most humiliating thing the father could do is to give a piece of his land while he's still alive. To say, I'm, while I'm still alive, I'm willing to give a piece of my life away. And the way the father would have to do this, there's a lot that happened in verse, between verse 12 and 13. The way that the father had to do this is he probably had to sell a piece of his land, a piece of his property off. He probably had to sell some of his livestock. He probably had to sell some of his assets, a third of his assets in order to give that to the youngest son. Now you must understand it was divided. And so the youngest son got his third and the oldest son obviously still has two thirds left. The father has now divided it. And you must understand this is that the father, by dividing his estate, his land, his wealth, um, his life, by dividing that among the sons, this youngest son literally leaves with the father's life. It, 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 it diminished the father's status in that whole community. And verse 13 says, And not many days after, the young son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and they wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Watch this. 
the son, the youngest son, doesn't just take the inheritance. He actually leaves the father. And the father lets him go. And this is a big lesson to learn about the heart of the father, is that the father does not manipulate the son to stay. The father does not force the son to stay. Even though the father's got the authority to, to do that, he does not do that. Let's learn something from the father. Our father loves us enough to let us go. And some of us need to hear this today, is that some, some of you need to love the people in your life enough to let them go, to let them learn, to let them come to their own realization. You cannot force someone to love you. You cannot force someone to listen to you. You cannot force someone. Once they're old enough, obviously when they're still younger, like my kids, I can still, they're still in my home. But once they're old enough to make their own decisions, I need to be able to let them go. Just like the father gave Adam and Eve a choice. He gave them their own free will. See, God does not want robots. God doesn't want just mere religious um, people that toe the line. God actually wants relationship. And relationship comes when you and I understand that we have free choice. And the father says, I'd rather let the son go in free choice than keep him and he stays against his will. I'd rather let him go. And so there's some people in your life that you need to let go. Please stop trying to manipulate people to stay in your life. I've even seen this in the church. Sometimes people have come to me and said, Mark, I'm leaving the church. And then I would say to them, Yo, my friend, this is so sad for me. It feels like a funeral every single time someone leaves. I despise it when someone leaves the church. But one thing I've learned is that I cannot keep people. And one person said to me, Mark, why don't you fight for me? Why don't you try and fight for me to stay here? And I looked at them like this and I said, I didn't die for you. I didn't pay for your life. You're not mine. You're his. And I cannot force you to be where you don't want to be. That's very, very difficult. And so it's amazing. Verse 14 shows us, it says, but when he had spent all, can you say he spent all? So he, he, he literally wasted it all. Then, he, then arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. So the son is now in want. The son is now getting to a place where he has some needs. I'm here to say that famine Knocks on everyone's door. Famine is inevitable. Famine's going to come. And I mean, this world is facing famine right now. The whole world is facing famine. South Africa has just gone into famine. I'm thankful to God that we're part of a church where people are being fed and we are being able to, to, to bring some hope and bring some life and even not only preach the gospel, but also show the gospel. I'm thankful for that. But it must break the Father's heart that people are standing in food lines that they don't have food to eat right now. It must break our Heavenly Father's heart that people are going to be hungry right now. It must break the Father's heart that the whole world is experiencing famine and not only physical famine, friends. There's emotional famine. There's people in depression right now. There's suicides happening. There's spiritual famine. People are far from God. They don't have salvation. They don't have hope. They don't have faith. They don't have love. The Father is crying out. He's, he must be longing to show His love and His sustaining love. His grace to those that desperately need Him. And if you've been far from God today, I'm here to say to you that you might be in a physical or a spiritual or an emotional famine. The Father wants you to come to your senses. But I'm here to say that all of us are going to face famine. And famine, even though it's, it's terrible and it's harsh, famine can actually help us recognize our need for our Father. And so in this very time where we don't have enough, this very time when we're not sure about the future, now is the time for us to come to our senses and to put our hope in our Father, to know that no stock market, no government, nothing can provide for us like our Father can provide for us. Verse 15 says, Then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Verse 16, And he would gladly be filled, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. I'm amazed. This son comes to the end of himself. He's in the middle of famine. And where does he go? He joins himself to another citizen. He joins himself to a foreigner. He tries to find solutions, tries to make a plan. Isn't that what we always do? We struggle financially. We, uh, we, we hit a financial famine. And guess what we do? We go to a credit card. Or we go to, to someone that can give us a loan. Isn't that amazing what we do? Sometimes what we do is we have a famine in our marriage. And instead of going to our Father in heaven... Where do we go? We go to someone else or we go to a book or we go to some or we just go to a divorce attorney. It's amazing how those challenges come. And when those challenges come, instead of running to our father, we often run elsewhere. Today, I want to say to you that you don't have to run somewhere else. 
If you've got a relational breakdown, you've got an emotional breakdown, maybe you've got a financial famine, maybe you're facing a, a, a marriage famine right now, or maybe you're facing even, even just... It's just a shame, you're feeling ashamed, or you may be feeling like a failure. If you're feeling like a failure today, I'm here to say to you that in the Father's house, you don't have to take any shame into the Father's house, you don't have to take any failures. Why? Because the Father wants to define you today. He wants to give you uh, affirmation. The, let, can you hear the voice of heaven? Like Jesus heard the voice of heaven when the Father spoke love and acceptance and affirmation over Jesus. Will you hear the voice? From heaven. Let's not listen to the other voices. Let's listen to the voice from heaven. I love how the son, he was desperate to even eat pig's food. But he got to, he came to the end of himself. And I believe that our father is not so much worried about or concerned about our possessions. He's, con he's after our love. Our father is not after uh, uh, you and me um, being in comfort, but he's after us getting to the end of ourselves. So that we can start with Him. So that we can turn our face back to Him and be radiant and experience His love, His acceptance and His blessing. Verse 17. When He had came, when He came to Himself. I love that. Could you say, He came to Himself? He came to Himself. So He realizes. He has, you know, the Father loves us so much that He will let us make our own decision to follow Him. He will not force us to come to Him. It says He said, how many... Of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare. So they've got bread, and they've got more than enough. And I perish, listen to this, with hunger. This son is realizing, what? My father's got hired servants, and they're better off than me. And I'm a son. I'm going to listen to what he says in verse, verse, verse 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Now, I love this. The son comes to the end of himself and he thinks of the generosity of his father. And he thinks of how his father even looks after those that aren't his children. Isn't that amazing how our father, you know, the Bible says he lets the sun shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you're close to God today, don't look bad. Look, don't look down on people that are far from God. But always trust God to, res to bring them to, to restoration. Why? Because the Father's got a heart for them. Remember, before you became a son of God, before you experienced your sonship, the Father was good to, you, good to you. The Father was gracious to you. He was kind to you, even though you did not deserve it. We don't deserve the Father's goodness, but He gives it anyway. The key is, will we embrace His goodness? Will we experience His goodness? And if you're far from God today, I want to ask you to do this. I want to ask you to arise. Maybe you want to type in the comments, far, F-A-R. I want to ask you to arise. I want to ask you to, to maybe, maybe to, right now today to say, Lord, I'm no longer going to be stuck in my shame. I'm no longer going to be stuck in my pride. I'm no longer going to be stuck even in the, my fear or stuck even in my rejection. I'm not going to be stuck in those lies of the enemy. I'm going to arise. I'm going to embrace the Father. I'm going to accept His, His invitation to come back to Him. Verse 19 says, And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's amazing how the son <laughs> disqualifies himself from being a son. He says, I am no longer worthy to be your son. Make me one of your hired servants. Now, I need to speak about this today because this touched me so much. I learned this from Tim Keller. The youngest son wanted to define himself as a hired worker, but the father did not make him a hired worker because his identity was not a hired worker. His identity, his DNA was a son. Now you must understand, he didn't say I want to be a slave because slaves could not pay, they could not earn anything. Slaves lived on the estate and slaves were owned by the master, by the owner of the estate. Now hired workers would come like we have in South Africa. We have hired workers that come in for work and then they go home and they earn a wage, they earn a salary. And he, what this, this son wanted to do, is he wanted to make himself. He said, can I, can I submit myself to you, Father? Please, I've sinned against heaven. Because remember, friends, no sin is primarily against man. It's all against God first and then to, against man. And guess what it does? He says, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me a hired servant. Why is he saying that? He says, I want to be a hired servant because I want to earn money to pay you back for the third of your life that you cut out of yourself to give to me. 
I'm willing to come back to pay you back. To pay you back is like me coming to my dad and saying, I'm going to pay you back for the battery that I dropped. I'm willing to come and I'm going to pay you back, Dad. Father, can I come and work for you? Can I come and earn something from you so that I can pay you back? And the Lord said this to me today. He said there's so many believers watching this. And if you're watching today, I want to ask you to connect with someone this week about this. So many believers are still trying to pay the Father back. Yes, you're in the Father's home, and yes, you're back on the estate, and yes, you've accepted His free gift of salvation, but you still want to pay Him back. You're still giving because you're trying to pay Him back for His love and His acceptance. You're still serving because you're trying to pay Him back. You're still spending time in prayer and in the Word, thinking that by doing these things, you are paying God back. Friends, please stop trying to pay your Father back. He does not want your stuff. He wants you. Because we think stuff. We think, he, we think he wants stuff. But he doesn't think stuff. He thinks relationship. He thinks you and me. I meet so many people today. They are thankful for what God has done. But they, 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 they're thankful for how they've been forgiven. But now they feel like they've got to earn God's approval. They feel like they've got to make right for what they did wrong. Because they make mistakes they, they stole, they lied, they cheated, they, 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 they messed up so badly that they feel like, how can this a loving father, how can this awesome, holy father accept me? And I'm here to say to you, friends, we don't deserve it. We can never, ever, we can never pay him back. We don't have it in ourselves. We're never good enough. Yes, in ourselves, we're not worthy to be his sons, but in Christ, we are worthy. Verse 20 is so powerful. It says, he says, and he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Remember we spoke about this last week? He ran, but I, I want to touch on this. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. See, that's what I love about the father. Is he's so in love with us that he throws, even though he's this great God, that he should be feared and he's holy and he's just and he's righteous. He's just as loving. That he would put his, he would fall on our necks and he would kiss us. That's intimate. Verse 21 says, and the son said to him, now here comes the speech that the son brings to the father. Here's the speech. The son says to the father, father, I have sinned, sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now he's going to carry on. He says, make me, that's what he wants to say. He wants to say, make me a high, high and said, whoa, whoa, make me a high and said. Guess what happens? Jesus, watch this. The father interrupts him. He starts his speech and the father says, stop, whoa, whoa. The father interrupts his speech. The father will not have any of it. The father will not let the son come with a plan to earn his love, the father's love. The father will not let the son come and say, no, I'll pay you back. Because the father does not want to hear that. The father doesn't want to hear that. You know what the father wants to hear? The father wants to sit here. I love you, dad. I want you. That's all the father wants to hear. And the father says in verse 22, he says, but the father said to his servants, the father just ignores the son. It's like the son comes with a story. The son says, I'll be a hired servant. The son, the son wants to say that. He's the son saying, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father says, the father does not even argue with the son. The father just does three things. He says to his servants, he says, bring out the best robe, put it on him. And, and then he says, put a ring on his hand and it says and sandals on his feet three things that the father says that the son needs to get he needs to get a new robe he needs to get a ring and he needs to get sandals we're going to touch on this over the next few weeks but this is powerful new robe that speaks of a brand new brand new authority brand new identity brand new identity new robe a robe of righteousness no longer no longer i'm not going to treat you based on your filthy rags because your self-righteousness is like filthy rags but this is a new identity a new life a new robe secondly he gives him a ring now that ring spoke of authority that ring spoke that the son could actually now make decisions with the father again because that ring they would use that as a signet ring and that would be the the ring by which they sign documents by which they, they actually take, say, listen, my son, you can make decisions with me. You can become part of my plan. I'm restoring you like this, my son. I'm restoring you. Why? Because you're mine. I've chosen you and I love you. You're mine, my son. 
And then the third thing is he puts new sandals on. And we know the sandals. Moses comes to the burning bush. And we know what happened at the burning bush. The father says to Moses, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Take off your gospel, Moses. And now with this, he's saying, he's saying in, in, in Romans, uh, uh, in actually in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, he says, we put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Actually, the father's saying to him, put on a brand new gospel. The gospel you had on, son, as you came here, you said, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be your son. The gospel you had on, son, you said, make me a hired, you thinking, make me a hired servant. The, son, the father says, no, 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 no. A new gospel says, I have done it all. I've paid it all. I love you because I love you. You're accepted, and from that place, you are now going to live your new life. The Father restores him. Verse 23 and 24, and we're going to land with this. It says, and bring the fatted calf, yeah, and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for the son of mine was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found, and they began to be merry. I want to say this, is that... The father celebrates the son, but listen to what the father says. The father does not focus on the son doing good. So if this was an earthly father, if this was me and my son left, do you know what my, my, my tendency would be to say? Yes, I want to hear this story now. When this guy comes back, I want to now see how he's going to work and how he's going to make right. Because remember, we took, we took some inheritance away here. Now when, the, when, when this son comes back, he better, he better have a good story. I want to hear what this son has to say. No, this father doesn't do that. This father says, this son was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. Now he's found. See, Tim Keller says this. He says, our father is not looking for good children. Most people say to me, Mark, I'm going to be able to go to heaven because I've been good all my life. The father's not looking for good people. He's looking for new people. That's what the father's looking for. The father's looking not only for good children, he's looking for new children. You and I are new. The son had a resurrection moment. He got to the end of himself and he, guess what happened? He rose. He had a resurrection take place and he became a new person. The Bible says whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. God wants you and me to be new. Why? Not new because of what we've done, new because of who he is. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're far from God. And you've been saying, man, I, Mark, I don't deserve anything. I've, I've messed up so badly. I stole from my father. I, I, this is the lies I told, the wastage. My life has been a waste. I'm exactly like this younger brother. I, I've messed up my life. I'm here to say to you today, the father's arms are wide open. Come to the father. Come and let him fall on your neck. Let him kiss you. Let him put a new robe upon you. Let him put a new ring on your finger. Let him give you new shoes, a new gospel, a new lifestyle, a new story to tell, the good news. Could you come to the Father today? Today is your day. Please type far. We'd like to pray with you. We'd like to connect with you. We would like for you to come home today. You might be saying, but I've lost the wonder. I've lost the wonder of what my Father in heaven did for me. I've lost the, I've lost the realization that actually I have a new robe. I have a brand new identity. I have new authority. I have a new gospel. Maybe you've forgotten this. Maybe you've forgotten that your father actually brought you back. The, 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 the price that he paid for you. Maybe you've forgotten how much you've been forgiven. Today, I want to ask you, I want to plead with you from my heart. I want to say, please, can you revisit the love of the father? Can you revisit how the father snatched you out of death and brought you into life? How there's resurrection life back over you. Could you remember that today? Could you respond to the father? And could you stop trying to pay him back, but just accept his free gift of grace? Let's pray. Jesus, I want to pray right now. If anyone watching is as close to you, they know you, they know you, but they've lost the wonder. Again, even for me personally, God, you've spoken to me again about the wonder. We've seen that young boy just being so happy to see his father. I want to have that wonder with my Abba, with my, with my father in heaven. That's the wonder I want. I want the wonder of what he's done for me, how he's restored me, how he's loved me, and how he gave himself for me. If you've lost the wonder, or maybe you just want a fresh revelation of the wonder, just maybe, I don't know if you want to put your hand on your heart or just lift your hands there in your home, and let's engage with our, our Father. In Jesus' name. But if you're far from God here this morning, and you're saying, I've been far from God, I've been disconnected from his love, I'm, I'm literally, I'm in a pigsty right now. I'm, I'm longing. I'm, I've, I've even tried other avenues, but nothing's working. I'm in famine and I need, I need to come back home. 
If that's you, today is your day of salvation. Lord, I want to pray every person that's far from you that today you draw them close. And those of us that's close to you, today set us on fire. Fill us with wonder. In Jesus' name. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun And fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Father's in the room Miracles take place